Hello, the Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum entitled The One Campaign and Fulbright Association. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for US alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 57 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the United States. Today, our hope is for you to learn more about the One Campaign and how you can get involved. I'm now going to turn it over to Madeline Philbin, Regional Organizing Manager at the One Campaign, and Daniel Henke, Director of U.S. Government Relations at the One Campaign. Madeline? Thank you. Delighted to be here, and I look forward to talking with you about the One Campaign and how we can work together. So just a sentence or two about who I am, so you know who you're listening to. I am the Regional Organizing Manager with the One Campaign, and my own story is I, I'm based in Chicago, and I started out as a community organizer in Chicago, and eventually that led me into international uh, work, working in the U.S., but on global issues. I worked for Catholic Relief Services for 10 years, which works on the ground overseas in international development. And for the last six years, I've worked for the One Campaign, which is focused on advocacy. And you'll be hearing more about that, but let me turn it over to Dan to introduce himself before we proceed. Thanks, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here with you today. I'm Dan Hinkey, the Director of U.S. Government Relations here at ONE. I started my career in Washington working for a United States Senator, a former United States Senator from Kansas, Senator Roberts, and then worked in a variety of government relations type positions in the private sector and in the in government, including at the US Agency for International Development and at the Defense Health Agency at the Department of Defense. And I've been at one a little over a year. It's been about 14 months, which has gone fast. Glad to be here. And I'll present a little bit on our one's advocacy and government coordination during the year in support of the Global Fund, which we will introduce you to. Back over to Madeline. Thanks. So let's start right now with our slideshow. Wouldn't be a presentation without a slideshow. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a year in the life of the One Campaign. I thought that might give you a good idea of what we're talking about. And of course, I hope you're listening in a way that's like, where would I fit in? What could I do? How could I be part of this? So a little bit about who we are and how you can get involved. Next slide. Of course, first things first, we'll start with Bono, who was the impetus for, for my even being here today, the Fulbright Association honoring him or, or presenting him as uh, the laureate last spring. Um, and one of the things he was being recognized for is co-founding ONE, the ONE campaign and RED. And uh, yeah, first things first with ONE and RED was Bono. He was the co-founder uh, along with Bobby Shriver. And if you go to the next screen, uh, you'll see a little bit about RED. You, some of you may remember RED. It started with a bit more of a splash than one did. Um, and the idea of RED is to use our power as a consumer. So certain brands designate certain products. If you purchase those products, the proceeds go to something called the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. So um, Apple sort of famously is one of the partners. If you buy a RED iPhone, the proceeds go to... Um, to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. So if you see somebody with a red iPhone, you know they're cool. If you buy a Fiat, a red Fiat, uh, the proceeds go to the Global Fund. Um, and there are smaller things as well. So each Chris, each year at Christmas time, and I'm just flagging it so you can look for it in about a month, Amazon will have a red catalog and any products you buy, the proceeds go to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. So, you know, red pajamas will go and, and there's many other choices. So that's um, one of the things Bono helped started and what he was being recognized for. The other is the One Campaign, which is more what we'll talk about today. Next slide. So the, the, uh, the mission of the One Campaign is to advocate to the various governments of the world to introduce policies which will end extreme poverty and preventable disease. 
You can see there the mission, you can see there the vision, a world without extreme poverty and preventable disease. Um, there, it turns out there actually is enough food on this planet to feed everyone. There's no reason to be living in extreme poverty. Preventable disease is preventable. Um, so people can live to their full potential and actively participate in the decision-making. This is the world we want. We fight for it alongside everyone who believes the same. We recognize we're not the only players here. And uh, we want the power of the people that influence people in power. So how great to work for an organization where this is our vision and what I get to work for toward every day. Next screen. So where do we work? Um, one works in the United States, but also the model of one is to get you know, folks all over the world to influence their respective governments all over the world. So it's, we, we're not just active in the US. So there's a one in Canada. There's one in, in Europe that influence in the EU, but also separately in Berlin, in Brussels, in Paris, in the UK, in Italy, and also in Africa. So in Nigeria, um, in South Africa. So again, collectively, we're all trying to, to influence our respective governments. Next slide. So our model of how we do this is advocacy as, as uh, we traditionally think of it, which is individuals, uh, people power, trying to influence those in power, um, trying to influence policymakers. But there are other aspects to our strategy. So we have to know what policy to advocate for. So we do spend time researching like what are what is good policy? What's going to work? What are the politics like? We don't have people speaking up for things that, that can't ever happen. We kind of figure out what are the politics and what's winnable? Who do we need to influence? We don't do this by ourselves. We do it in partnership with others. And of course, pop culture, we really try to use that tool, Bono and other celebrities. And here's a very short video that will say that better than I have just done. This isn't about charity. It's about justice. We don't use shovels to dig wells. Our voices are our tools. Speaking up. Demanding action. We come together as one. Seven million strong. Geeks and guitarists. Soccer moms and students. From LA to Lagos. Putting politics aside. I really do believe that we can make poverty history. To the One Campaign, thank you for bringing us together. Saying whatever must be said, however we need to say it. You me? We are rebels with a cause, armed with powerful data that can save lives. Mobilizing, advocating, persuading. If you empower a woman, you empower a whole continent. You empower a whole people. Because where you live shouldn't determine whether you live. Together, we've cut extreme poverty in half and we refuse to stop until we finish the job. Join us. Thank you. Next slide. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what this looks like in the US. Next slide, please. So we advocate in the US. Who are these advocates? They're you, they're me. So who are one's activists in the US? They're college students, they're community members, they're faith leaders. Who are the policymakers that we're trying to influence? It's always gonna be White House or Congress. So we don't work at the state level or the local level. We're trying to influence federal policy. So the White House could be the president, it could be the State Department. Um, and of course, Congress, your Senator, your representative, and then what are the actions that we ask people to take? We often refer to them as high impact actions. So the action that has the highest impact is actually meeting directly with the member of Congress or their staff person. We know this through a study that an organization called the Congressional Management Foundation does every year to getting feedback from congressional offices about what actually does have an impact. So the highest impact is, is an in-person meeting and the next highest is a handwritten letter. So we really focus on those two uh, activities, meeting, collecting letters, delivering them. 
And um, and how do we know what to ask for? So we have our our global our government relations colleagues. Dan will talk more about that. Who's figured out exactly what to ask for? So here's an example of who we are. This is just a team from Indiana. It's a mixture of campus volunteers, faith leaders, community leaders. Next slide. Here's an example of those actions that I was mentioning. So tabling. I can write a handwritten letter, that's great, but can I get 12 other people to do it? And it has even more impact. So our volunteers will go to events where they might find like-minded people, the kind of people who would write a letter about global health, or maybe they belong to an organization, maybe it's their sorority, maybe they belong to Rotary, or of course, an example here today, maybe your full bike chapter at a meeting, everyone would write a letter to the Senator or member of Congress. Next slide. And in-person meetings are the most effective. So if you've collected letters, it might be literally, hey, contact from the office. Could we bring these letters by? Usually you're meeting with the staff person, naturally not the member of Congress. And during the um, lockdown, we continued this. We just met um, virtually with our members of Congress. Next. And we always try the strategy of not only public mobilization or people power, good policies, politics, partnerships, but when we can, we bring in pop culture. And we did have an opportunity to do so actually last spring when, when you Fulbright brought Bono to the US, we took advantage of his presence and had him meet with uh, some folks at the State Department. Uh, I think he's meeting there with Tony Blinken. And then what's great, um, and he's not just meeting to meet with him, he's meeting to advocate. And in that case, we were very much focused on getting COVID-19 vaccines to low-income countries and then Ideally, as what's happened here is the folks we're trying to influence, they end up uh, tweeting out our messaging in a sense because they're excited about meeting Bono. So we use him whenever we can. Next slide. So to just kind of make this all a little bit more real, um, we're gonna talk about the Global Fund campaign. So that was much of what this year was about. The Global Fund that you'll be hearing a little bit more about, or I've mentioned a few times, is this fantastic public-private partnership. It's 20 years old. It is a fund, a global fund, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, these preventable diseases. But every three years, the world community needs to recommit to this fund. And so this was a recommitment year or a replenishment conference. It just took place in New York in September. So much of the year was really about this campaign of how do we get, yeah, we're going to get, you know, nobody's going to really say no at this point, but how do we make sure it's fully funded, it's boldly funded, um, every year for 20 years, we've had an impact uh, that is HIV, AIDS, malaria. It's been decreasing because of this work. And then the lockdown hit. And we, for, for the first time, we began to lose ground. So the Global Fund became more important than ever to make sure that this losing ground is just a temporary thing and that we continue to make progress against these diseases. So if we go to the next screen, there's just a very short and less than two minute video about what the Global Fund is. Where you live cannot decide whether you live. When millions were dying from preventable diseases, we all had a choice. Accept it or fight. Do nothing or say no. Not in our lifetime. Not when the knowledge and skills to save those lives are ready and waiting. Not now. Not ever. You know, right now, we're on track to end the scourge of HIV AIDS. That's within our grasp. And we have the chance to accomplish the same thing with malaria. We refuse to accept it. We took action. We changed the story. Brought people together. From all over the world. From every background. Gave them all an equal voice. United against the world's deadliest diseases. No egos, no spectators. We had to be all in. And it's worked. We've become a force that can face tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV head on. $14 billion is not just cash. It is the four pills I need to stay alive. A force that saved 38 million lives in 20 years. And now we're here, together. We know the job isn't finished. We still have a way to go, new challenges to face. But we have taught each other, helped each other. We're stronger now than we've ever been. 
because of the choice we made. The choice to do something, to change the story. When I first mooted the idea of a global fund, quite a lot of people laughed it off saying, there he goes again dreaming. You know, and I, I love dreams. It always starts with a dream. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to talk a little bit about this campaign year and what we've been doing. Of course. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you for the, the good introduction of one and what the Global Fund does. As Madeline mentioned, it is a public-private partnership between government donors, private sector donors, and it runs in three-year replenishment cycles. So every three years, those donors come together and recommit or pledge funding for the next three years. Um, this year was one of those years, 2022, and the US government was the host. So they hosted the replenishment conference in New York. But before we get there, I wanna start and look at the, about where the Global Fund works and I'll explain how it works. So organizations that provide you know, antiretrovirals for people suffering with AIDS or pass out mosquito nets to prevent malaria, they can apply through the global fund, for funding through the Global Fund and then are able to go and work across the world. You'll see this map. The majority of, our, of the efforts are in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's not limited to, to Sub-Saharan Africa. There's investments in North Africa and the Middle East, in Europe, in the Asia Pacific, and even in Latin America in the Western Hemisphere as well. Um, we'll move to the next slide, please, Alicia. These are, from a US specific standpoint, some statistics on over the last 20 years, what US taxpayers and advocates contribution has been. You can see because of the US alone, 14 million lives have been saved. There's nearly seven and a half million people have been able to get on antiretroviral therapy to fight to fight AIDS. We've had people treated for tuberculosis. 63 million mosquito nets were distributed in 2020 alone, which is a, a huge number. And the US has continu continuously been the leader on the Global Fund and was able to showcase that by hosting the conference this year. We even broke down this data as we were preparing for the conference and meeting with members of Congress and their staff we, we broke this down by state and could show, okay, here's how much money Connecticut, or how much, how many lives Connecticut taxpayers saved from, from their specific um, tax dollars at work or Arizona or um, Washington state, et cetera. So we were able to aggregate that data, which was really, really useful as we were advocating on the Hill. They could say, oh, wow, my, my constituents are really having an impact on this and have, have saved millions of lives. And since that video came out a few years ago, the number has actually increased. So 50 million lives have been saved from the Global Fund, which is fantastic. And, but work continues to be done. We'll move on to the next slide, please. So some of the advocacy efforts, Madeline mentioned at the start of our presentation, we typically have a large, a big, in-person event um, fly-in where we bring our advocates to Washington, D.C. They go in and they meet with their members of Congress and staff and they, we usually have a set of topics, whether it's education or food security. This year we looked at global COVID funding or in fighting COVID as well as urging a strong U.S. commitment to the Global Fund. This year we did that virtually and despite the virtual environment, we were still able to meet with more than 300 congressional offices. We delivered postcards, both in district and in state and in Washington, to congressional offices, to the State Department, to the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, just encouraging U.S. commitment and contribution and, and highlighting that through Voices of Americans. I sometimes laugh that members of Congress and their staff tire of hearing from us in Washington, those of us who work in the government, government relations sector, and they love hearing from their constituents and, and their leaders in their communities. 
there was advocacy at music festivals and other you know major societal events and it was music festivals not just in the us um, and around the world as well we hosted a global fund specific event ahead of the baseball game that had more than 200 congressional staff in attendance and that event was to thank them for their continued support and to urge them to continue U.S. support for the Global Fund. And we'll move to the next. Um, in the third week of New York, so the 18th through the 21st, the United States government, or the third week of September, excuse me, the United States government hosted the seventh Global Fund Replenishment Conference in New York City on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly meetings. And it's an actual, as Madeline mentioned, it's an actual conference. There are people that who, who have been impacted positively by the work of the Global Fund. There are government leaders who speak and, and emphasize the importance of the Global Fund. And then they all come together on the final day. And it's the actual, in most cases, it, it's the leaders. So President Biden was there, President Macron, um, and other you know, key, key leaders from throughout the world came together and then they announced their country's pledge. This year, the donor community, both private sector and governments pledged $14.25 billion with a few outstanding. Um, we're, we're expecting both the United Kingdom and Italy to come in with contributions by the end of the year as, you know, Queen Elizabeth's death kind of Put a halt on most of their government work in the in the UK, and then um, with as they they figured out their leadership shuffle. But we do expect this number will increase. And then Italy held elections right in the middle of of the global fund replenishment campaign. Um, I served on one's project team for the global fund. So when we're doing big campaigns, we put together staff and colleagues from all of our markets, so North America, Europe, and Africa, as a way to bring in voices and kind of say, okay, here's how we should do advocacy. Here's our messaging throughout the world and making sure that there's a coordinated effort while doing you know, US specific advocacy and whatnot um, leading up to the conference. And then we were able to see eight new donors provide funding, including um, Burkina Faso and you know, other countries that have typically been recipients of global fund projects, now they're able to go back and contribute. Indonesia was a large commitment that was a new one. And many donors increased their commitments greatly. So in um, South Korea, for example, increased their commitment by 300%, which, which is huge. But Asia started to, the Asian countries have started to become even more involved in global health. Um, they have been leaders, but they've, they've taken a, a keen interest. And we'll move to the next slide. One of our advocacy efforts for one across all of our markets in Europe and in North America was encouraging G7 leaders to rewrite the future. You know, we always say you can you can't rewrite history, but you can rewrite the future and, and to make sure that these three diseases are not in, are not around and don't have to be have to be fought or managed or aren't getting people sick. And this year, ahead of the G7 conference, which was held in Switzerland, the advocates of in each of our markets did postcard send offs. So they went to whether it was the seat of parliament or the president's residence or where the president worked. And they sent these postcards that um, said, dear G7 leaders, rewrite the future. And then on the back, it says, you know, please fight these diseases. All of our lives depend on it. And we had numerous activists and staff across the world participate in these events. And it's just kind of one example of, of things we do to push our leaders, but to also show the, the depth and breadth of support for these issues. So here's a, another picture of, of just kind of putting the global in global activism. You know, in Canada, 
they did a stunt, you know, they swarmed Parliament in mosquito costumes, but they also had a, it's not just about um, doing an, an event that gets some buzz, sorry, couldn't resist that one, but it's also about actually making contact with the policymakers. So in their case, they, they picked one day where they made sure folks were calling in to their, their uh, representatives. France similarly did kind of a high profile event projecting onto some of um, the better known buildings in Paris, getting some attention to the issue, but then also hand delivering a petition that was signed by the citizens of France, urging uh, robust funding for the Global Fund. Next slide. And just, you know, some other examples, similarly in the Netherlands, um, they had a stunt, you know, fight for what counts was our tagline. So they were inviting their members of parliament to come, you know, punch a punch a punching bag and, and a number of them did, but then it was also an opportunity to talk to them directly about supporting fully funding the global fund. Similarly, um, we have uh, one campaign has something called youth ambassadors in the European Union and they were very active and other activities in Germany, Ireland, Spain, Italy, and actually, again, referring back to Bono, he really helped get Japan, who was one of the uh, first countries to publicly say what their commitment was, to say what uh, a very, again, a, a significant dollar amount, and that kind of set the tone. Um, you know, the first one out there saying, this is what we're committing, helped set the tone for everybody else. So that was a significant um, um, win that he was able to influence them or talk to them or open them up to that idea. Um, the, the, as, um, as Dan mentioned, the replenishment conference was in New York uh, this year. It isn't always in New York. Three years ago, it was in France. So it was kind of a big deal that it was in New York. And the next slide. So meanwhile, we had been doing many activities throughout the US to gather handwritten letters. That um, upper corner there is a music festival. Can you tell by the clothing they're wearing? Um, if you do decide to get involved with one, you too could have one of those cool one black and white t-shirts. But then we had uh, folks in New York and on the day that the replenishment conference was to take place, it ended up being the day of the funeral for Queen Elizabeth. So many of the heads of state, President Biden, President Macron, were not in New York. So they rescheduled the replenishment conference. We hung around an extra couple of days. They just rescheduled from like a Monday to a Wednesday. But a few other people who were there for the conference also hung around, including Bono and Bill Gates. So they popped in to see us and then later Bill Gates tweeted, which is what I've got there. And that's probably the only time like my picture will be in a tweet from Bill Gates, but I'm in that crowd somewhere. So uh, it was a, a good reward for our folks who had been so active all year long to be in New York like that and see the commitment. Next slide. So I said I was gonna talk about a year in the life and uh, the year's not over with. And even though the global fund that happened in September, it's not like we'd go home and say, okay, we're done for the year. We're on to the next issue, which is a real call to action around food security. And as you probably know, or been hearing about, you know, that we're in a crisis, we're, we're at a verge of a crisis um, in terms of people having access to food uh, throughout the world. And um, we're, we're, we have a combination of many shocks happening at the same time, economies that haven't really recovered from the lockdown, the impact of the war in Ukraine, and it's affecting folks' ability to access food. We can do something about it in the United States through something called, a program called Feed the Future, which is authorized through a vote called Global Food Security Act. And if you go to the next slide. So that's uh, actually what we're asking our volunteers to do right now is to contact their senator to co-sponsor the Global Food Security Act. So just a little quick context, it has to be passed by the House and by the Senate. It's already been passed by the House. We need it to pass by the Senate. We're in a congressional session, which ends at the end of this year, right? Elections are coming up and everything starts over again. So if we don't pass it basically by January, by the end of the year, we have to start from scratch. So we really want to get it across the finish line by getting the Senate to also pass the Global Food Security Act. The two bills are reconciled. The president signed it. It's actually not the kind of thing most people oppose. I mean, people get that there's a food crisis, food security, it's not really a controversial issue. So the risk is more, it just gets lost in politics because it's not a priority for anyone. And that's why we've chosen a strategy of let's get as many senators to sign in as a co-sponsor because that kind of gets the message across of like, no, actually this matters. We're gonna make sure it passes before the end of the year. 
So um, I know that print is kind of small, but again, if you're thinking of getting involved, one of the things we might ask you to do is contact your senator. If your senator's not already signed on as a sponsor, they are already signed on, thank them. Odds are both of them probably aren't signed on. So there's gotta be a senator you can reach out to and say, hey, would you please add your name as a co-sponsor? So this is action. Congress will, will return. Uh, they're all on recess due to the election, but they'll be returning in about two weeks. And we want to get the Senate to move this forward. So that's that's our current action moment in this year in the life of the one campaign. So if you go to the next screen, there's one more thing that we haven't talked about. We've talked about what we do and where we work and how we work, but why do we do this work? And I think there's probably as many different answers as there are people on this call but they are give, they're I'll give you Bono's answer. I think we heard it in one of our videos. Where you live in the world should not determine whether you live in the world. So share that final screen. I hope that you can see yourself in our work and um, would love to, I invite you to sign on to a link. I think it's been dropped into the chat. If you'd like a, a one staff person to come out to your chapter, if you'd like us to do a presentation, if you wanna meet a local one volunteer, we love to connect with you really any way that you want to connect with us. And so just click on that form, just give us your name, your contact information, super short, and we'll follow up. But um, also we'd like to open it to any questions you have about what you heard this morning or any other questions you have about our work or about one. I think uh, Alicia is gonna share those questions with us. And in the meantime, maybe Dan, I'll ask you a question. I mentioned that we're reaching the end of the Congress. So do you have any sense of what will happen with this global food security legislation between now and uh, December 31st? Cynical answer is, does anyone have any guess of what Congress will do? But um, I think there is some momentum. You know, we have some key, some key bills that will need to be passed, including a government funding bill, including the defense authorization, so there will be moments. I wouldn't be shocked if Global Food Security Act came towards the end. So Congress usually, when we get to this point in an even numbered year and the 117th Congress is coming to a close and the 118th Congress will start in January, they often wait until the end of the year and some of the bills that have passed one chamber or the other then get brought up um, between the election time and the end of the year. So I, I do expect something will happen. Um, there's no opposition to the idea of reauthorizing Global Food Security Act. It's just some, some wording issues they've got to get around and just timing with key other key bills that need to pass as well. And it's sort of right now, they're not back in session until after the election. So right now it's sort of wait and see for 10 more days and then hopefully they'll they'll get back to work. Which does actually make it a good time to reach out to your local office and yeah. ask um, the Senator to co-sponsor. So we have a sample letter, of course, if anyone's interested in doing this, it always helps to have a, a script or not just have a blank piece of paper in front of you and we'd be happy to share that with you as well. Staff are working, they've been responsive to, to some advocates of late. So they're there and they're they're available. Uh, we have one question from the Q&A. <clears throat> they ask, in addition to volunteer opportunities, are there full-time opportunities at one? And if so, in what types of areas and where could they find out about those things? Sure. I mean, so one works in the U.S. So the one, what we'll speak to works in the U.S. So um, we our main office is in D.C. And then we have field staff in different parts of the country. I work, as I say, I'm based in Chicago. But most of our staff is based in Washington, D.C. I'm part of that field, you know, out there with volunteers, but there's other people who do like communications and are, and there's folks that do what Dan does, which is they're on the Hill. And um, there's other folks who are really focused figuring out our policy work. Those are all D.C. based jobs. If you went to um, one.org, you know, you'd see the positions open that we have available. We do have internships as well. Um, so if you're sort of like right out of college or you know someone who is, who's interested in a short-term experience in DC through one, that's another thing to consider. It seems like to me that there's always jobs open, but you know, 
not the one looking for them. So you you kind of just kind of keep an eye on uh, on our website. There are jobs that open in our offices in London and you know in Berlin and Paris as well. We don't do development on the ground. I know sometimes people ask about that. So we're we're just about advocacy. We're not about um, we're not we don't have folks on the ground implementing these programs that we advocate for. I'm, I'm on the website. I can't find the careers page. I do find it a volunteer page that I can put into the um, into the chat. It's all the way down at the bottom. There's like a jobs. It's either says work at one or it just says jobs. Oh, they, oh I see. Gotcha. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Great. I'll put that in the chat. Thank you. OK, another question is, how do I find opportunities in my city? Opportunities to volunteer or to advocate. Oh, yeah, both. Yeah. So you can you could go to the website and volunteer as, as uh, you just mentioned, there's a spot on the website. But actually, at this point, um, since you have our contact information, it would make more sense to just contact Dan or I directly and say, hey, this is where I live. I'm interested in getting involved. Um, many parts of the country, we have one volunteers or one chapter. And you know, I'll just throw out Phoenix as an example. So we hit, or Arizona as an example. So we have a cluster of volunteers who are kind of in the Phoenix area. We have some like Flagstaff. Um, they'll get together to meet with Senator Sinema's office or Senator Kelly's office. So we, in that case, we might connect you to somebody local and maybe you know start out by meeting in a coffee shop and then you can either meet with a group and write letters together, the 10 of us in this shop, or again, to use the Arizona example, I know they go to certain events, they go to uh, Earth Day events and set up a table because they figure the kind of people who go to this are the kind of people who probably would be interested in writing a letter and care about this issue. So you can become involved that way as well. That, awesome, uh, yeah, and, and we've put uh, your email addresses and the form link into the chat so people will be able to follow up with you if they have Super. questions offline yeah like i said we're happy to come um either physically in person in real life to your chapter event or um or participate virtually um we have facebook groups um, you could also follow and just kind of see what's going on with one that way um, of course. In addition, in, a, in addition to Madeline, there are regional organizers across the country as well. So many cities, they'll put together specific events and we're always recruiting more. So we'd love to have as many volunteers um, and those who want to apply to work at one as well. Maybe because of uh, our founder, a lot of Often music festivals is where we volunteer or we have people who are interested in music festivals and say, hey, so we'll set up a table. So like Lollapalooza in Chicago traditionally is a place where people would have a table and you get, hey, have you had a chance to write your senator yet? And, you know, at Bonnaroo, we actually have tables when U2 is on tour. We always, that's a moment we're always looking for volunteers. So um, if they're ever on the road again, you could shoot us an email saying, hey, how, how can I volunteer? And those are you know, great settings to get people to write letters and get them to learn about how to become active. You know, we're usually not trying to convince someone who isn't interested in this issue. We're, we're, we're actually preaching to the choir, right? We're talking to people who are, care about these issues, but don't know how to get involved. And, or they say, I can't go volunteer in Africa, or I don't have enough money to donate. And the point is, you know, more powerful than volunteering in Africa or donating whatever little amount you have, more powerful than that is using your voice, talking to your senator, talking to your congressman. Um, another question is, you probably get a lot of volunteers. How do you choose the ones who become volunteers? Well, you know, we're, we're open to all, so it's not, there isn't anyone that we say, no, you can't volunteer. So the question is more matching, you know, people's skills and interests with, what we're looking for. So, um, you know, some volunteers, their favorite part of volunteering is actually meeting with the member of Congress or their staff person. And other volunteers are like, their anxiety, performance anxiety, like that's a little unnerving and they'd much rather do the tabling at the farmer's market and get people the right letters. So you kind of just like try to match, you know, 
where are you, what, what are you most comfortable with? Everything is about communicating in some way with the policymaker. So we don't just sign people up to be members, whatever that means. You know, we, we, it's always write a letter, join a meeting, make a phone call, I'll write a letter to the editor. We actually find that pretty effective. If, if the letter to the editor mentions a specific issue and mem mentions a specific member of Congress, then it actually can have real impact. So some people are more behind the scenes, but they'll, they'll write a letter and they'll contact their local newspaper. So yeah, we, we're, we welcome any volunteer and it's by talking to me or my colleagues, we kind of help you figure out what's the best thing to fit with what you wanna do. Uh, the next question is from myself. Um, the uh, so right now the the largest issue that you're focused on in the future, like for the forecast ahead, is food security. Exactly. Are there any other? Is that like the number one and two and three priority, or are there other things that you for, foresee as um, issues in the future? Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to start that, and I'm going to hand it over to Dan. So. We're always focused on an issue that we think can move in Congress. So it's partly what is that Congress actually working on? And um, so food security is like an active piece of legislation right now. Um, so I think funding, you know, make, making sure the global fund, for example, commitment is actually funded is sort of a, a real piece of paper thing people need to vote on. But I'm part, partly throwing it to Dan because we have a new Congress next year, a new congressional session that begins for two years. And it's again, it's like a clean slate. So you might have a, a crystal ball that can tell us what issues we could be working on in the next two years, Dan. Thanks, Madeline. It's it's sort of cyclical. So in addition to what Madeline said, we've also been pushing for full funding of the government, particularly the issues under the State Department that are focused on global health, international development, international education, those types of things, which food security falls under. For 2023 calendar year, we don't actually have anything like the Global Fund or the Global Partnership from Education that needs to be author or um, replenished. So we'll focus on legislation and we'll focus on funding the US government and working in tandem with our, our colleagues on pandemic prevention. One, of, one thing, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief or PEPFAR, which is the legislation that that was passed under George W. Bush and allows the U.S. government to actually go and provide these treatment to people living with HIV AIDS across the world. It's been hugely successful. It's the impetus for why one was founded. That has to be reauthorized every few years. It 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 expires and then Congress just goes back in and shows support. And so starting come January, we'll be working hard with um, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, House Foreign Affairs Committee, and others on pushing that reauthorization and ensuring that, that it is adequately funded. And then we'll be looking, we've started looking at the after effects of the pandemic on the world. So how can we bolster economic development and prevent the next pandemic from happening as well? So things are coming up. Um, governments are working on on these issues, and we're encouraging them to 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 pass it pass it through. And it's it's a little bit cyclical, so you know there there will be there will always be appropriations bills and spending bills that come up, which are are, are good things to push. Um, and there's usually issues or two. You know, we've got World AIDS Day is December first, so we'll we'll do some pushes on World AIDS Day when there's polio day, world malaria day, world tuberculosis day, these things that are that are re big internationally recognized days focused on on fighting those diseases, we'll send out numerous emails, we'll have our, our advocates send out letters and, and communication actions to their members of Congress and making sure that the members continue to focus on fighting those diseases. We, you know, we work in collab collaboration with other uh, like-minded organizations. There's kind of like, what, like a trade association of international advocates. It's called inter interagency, no, interaction called interaction. And so together, we'll talk about what what legislation do you think is going to pass, or has a, a possibility, 
in previous years, we've done some things energy related. So something called Electrify Africa, as its name suggests about uh, getting energy resources to Africa, something called the uh, Creating the Development Finance Corporation, which also made it easier for small businesses to borrow money for development within Africa. So, you know, sometimes we're actually working on good policy um, and sometimes it's funding things we already know that work, but we wanna make sure they continue to be funded. Much of the last two years was related to vaccines and getting uh, uh, low-income countries have access to vaccines. We initially, you know, were doing like pretty good. The US was really a leader on that. And if you saw it on the news, you know, vaccines delivered to Haiti, vaccines delivered to Indonesia, you know, vaccines delivered to Central Africa, you were really seeing it. And then that slowed down tremendously. So that's been frustrating, but then that's where we kind of go back to the drawing board and that's the politics of it. Think, okay, so what, what do we need to do? You know, if we can't, if we can't get a global response we're looking for, maybe some smaller pieces, maybe we need to influence the World Bank to make more, you know, forgiveness of loans available or whatever. So we're always kind of strategizing what, what do you think is going to happen? So I don't know, it was a long, a long answer to your question, but hopefully it gives you a little picture of what we're thinking is ahead. We don't ever just go in and say, well, our issue is poverty. Our issue is climate change or our issue is, it's always like, what's an actual policy or piece of legislation that we think can pass that's going to have an impact on climate or poverty or, or uh, health. I'm glad that, Madeline, make, that makes I'm sense. Glad, I'm glad Madeline brought up the World Bank. Earlier this month, the US hosted the World Bank meetings here in Washington. And so finance ministers and the Treasury Secretary and, and other leaders gathered and we we had a stunt and we had our, our volunteers in and they pushed around a big case of fake money and said, you know, and the idea was the money is there to, you know, help bolster economies, help loan forgiveness, and governments just need to act on, on that. So it was kind of the rebuilding economic situation in, in developing countries after COVID. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off. No, no, that's perfect. That, so that, that, that gives us some insights on how, how you guys make decisions about which issues that you will take on, which is really important to understand the why and the how of what the one campaign is doing, not just it's good and you should volunteer, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's great to hear about the, the kind of the back end of how you're making, you know, these strategic um, decisions. It's definitely, having obviously lived through this pandemic with all of you, it mattered a lot to me that I was working on an issue that was the issue I was living. Uh, it, you know, in some ways there was no way to ever escape work in that sense, but it wasn't just being frustrated. It's actually like, okay, I'm frustrated and I can do something. You know, I, I work for an organization that sort of figured out well, what's the best way to move ahead and getting vaccines out there. And so I don't know if there's any of you listening that are the same way, like, well, how do I do something about global food security at this moment? Or, you know, it's not like one's like, oh, this is a good volunteer thing I should do. It's actually, if you're feeling powerless, it we say, no, you know, you have your voice and we'll help you figure out who to talk to and what to say. Um, well, we only have five more minutes left, so I will, uh, um, if you have any last uh, minute advice or uh, statements, otherwise, um, uh, everyone has the um, email and information in the chat, um, so they can reach out to you. Um, this will be made available to the entire alumni via um, video recording, since recording this. Um, but yeah, I'll let you guys have the last word and then um, we'll say goodbye. Dan, chill. Sure. I'll go first. I would, you know, we'd love to have you all advocate and be part of one and one volunteers. And I have found having worked in similar government relations type jobs, both within the US government in Congress and at, at private sector organizations, it's been really, really unique to work for an advocacy organization and it, your voices are important and those matter and those can move 
the needle on things. As I mentioned, you know, they they tire of hearing from us in Washington. They they love hearing from from constituents and people in their communities and faith leaders and educators and parents and everyone and students. And so just use your voice, get involved. Um, we'd love to have you, of course, but it really does matter and it does make a difference even on the days and in the times when it doesn't feel like it does. Yeah, thanks. You know, we, we wanna make sure there isn't anyone in Congress who says no one's talking to us about this. So even if you're feeling like, you know, I know our Senator is never gonna, or she's never gonna do this. It's still important that when Dan goes to meet the Senator staff, they're never going to say, well, no, none of my constituents are talking to me. You know, it's always going to be, yeah, we, Dan will be like, I know you got that, that email, you had that meeting in Phoenix or wherever. So, um, so it, it always matters. It never doesn't matter. Yesterday, I actually went over to, up, up to Milwaukee and met with a volunteer. And so maybe I'll just leave it at that. It was, you know, it's one of those days that reminds me like, why I keep doing this? Because I meet such good people. You know, this was a volunteer. And maybe especially in these times we need that shot in the arm because we hear so much about a lot of really crummy people out there to hear just to meet people who are just you know fighting the good fight and for years have been advocating while they're living their full lives and doing their jobs and their families but who really um their, their own value is i need to be doing something i need to be using my voice to make a difference in the world and when i meet people like that it makes me sign up for another another few years with one campaign. So I hope I get to meet all of you one place or another before long. But thanks for calling in today for sure. Thanks so much, Madeline, Daniel, and the one campaign for um, giving us your time and energy and um, sharing with the Fulbright Association all that you do. So we really appreciate it and um, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>